Greetings, folks, and welcome to this week's episode of the Herbal Hour podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Tim Irving. He is a chiropractor that practices in Southeast Portland with a master's degree in human nutrition, and he's also a professor at the National University of Natural Medicine. In this episode, we discuss the neuroscience of pain, how beliefs shape chronic pain, and share ideas that revolutionize our views of what pain is and how we can be free of it. Dr. Irving shares a lot of fascinating ideas about how we can change our perspectives on chronic pain. So I hope you guys tune in. Thanks for listening. So can you tell our audience a little bit about how you got started in the field and what kind of you specialize in? Sure, Bogdan. Yeah, thanks for the intro. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, my uh, my kind of intro to this world of of pain, pain education, things like that came from, uh, as it, as it does with a lot of, uh, people that end up in, in, in these kinds of professions, um, uh, injuries. Uh, I was in a pretty bad car accident when I was younger and sustained some, some pretty, uh, life-threatening injuries. And through my process of rehabilitation, I was introduced to various forms of healthcare. Um, and as a result, kind of suffered from chronic pain for, for quite a number of years, uh, at least 25 years or so. And um, through the process, I, you know, started studying, you know, in in college, studying various uh, subjects that would lead to a, a, uh, a job in healthcare, a career in healthcare, was really thinking about physical therapy for a while and on and off, ended up in Colorado, uh, studying massage at the Boulder College of Massage Therapy. And then through working with an osteopath, I was turned on to, to chiropractic care and uh, decided to go that route. Um, and this, this process was like a uh, 10 to 15 year process. So it wasn't that, it wasn't quickly. Um, and then uh, through circumstances that happened with the uh, Colorado College of Chiropractic, I ended up in, in Portland, Oregon, studying at, uh, at the time, Western States Chiropractic College. And now it's called the University of Western States. Through that process, especially in uh, in massage school, what I realized was um, there were a lot of things I was being taught that when when you actually look at it a little bit, you find out there's possibly other points of views. There are a lot of things in massage school you're taught. You know, this technique does this specific thing to this specific tissue, and then you realize, well you know, there's hundreds of techniques out there and a lot of them have contradictory mechanisms. So that's, that's weird. That's about as far as I got. I started thinking a little bit critically in massage school, uh, got into a little trouble doing that by, you know, asking questions and having the, the authority figures say, you know, you know, these things aren't, these things have been decided by people much smarter than you. So just, just digest it. And I, I didn't push that. That continued in chiropractic school, having that experience before before chiropractic school. That that same uh, process continued in chiropractic school, and I, I got a lot deeper with it. I started started really questioning a lot of things. Um, by the time I graduated chiropractic school, I realized there's there's a lot more to uh, persistent pain or chronic pain than uh, than I was led to believe as a student. Um, so through that process and opening up my own clinic and working through a few kind of hurdles with regards to, to having that mindset, but also being a chiropractor, I I started diving into this uh, pain, persistent pain and therapeutic neuroscience education or pain education, and uh, really got connected into various circles. Um, Through that whole process, I I really discovered how, um, how I learn and how I think and really started to to get into philosophical levels of, you know, fundamental critical thinking, rational thought, that kind of stuff as well. And that's kind of where I am. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I, I truly believe that, that knowledge, there's fundamental aspects of knowledge that, uh, that transcend delivery systems and professions and things like that. And I'd really like to, I like to kind of imbibe anything that I do with that. in mm. mind. So uh, being on your shift, I, really appreciated the fact that you didn't really just take opinions and truth on authority. You always kind of question and 
offered perspectives on things that it didn't even seem like there was any other perspective. Like it was just this, you know, like the common idea that uh, if you have pain, it's from a physical source, it's from an injury that didn't heal and it can occur years later um, and things of that notion. What are some of the most surprising things that you learned about pain and the research behind pain? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Honestly, I think what you brought up is probably the most profound thing is that, that and I was taught this too, and, and through my physical injuries, I was basically told that I'd probably have pain the rest of my life, and it was because of these injuries. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm not, while I do it, there's a psychological uh, reason why most of us appeal to authority, and I do that. I, I'm more prone to not appealing to authority. And I think that's part of my makeup. So, so it, it primed me for this. Um, you know, the, the, I think the biggest thing that I learned was that, yes, I had this tissue damage and that's in my history, but the pain problem that persisted after that tissue had gone through the healing processes and had surgery and things like that um, was more the issue than the initial injury at this point. And that was probably the biggest thing. The most surprising thing, I think you asked that, that question, mm-hmm. was I had, uh, there were two, two major areas that I had persistent pain in, uh, shoulder and low back. And um, especially uh, when I started Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and as a white belt, pushing a lot, doing things that you're not supposed to do that are fundamentally unsound, um, I started to have a significant amount of shoulder pain. And through the process of learning about the modern ideas of pain and, you know, watching, um, seeing and watching lectures done by people like Lorimer Mosley, uh, David Butler, Ronald Melzack, Patrick Wall, some of the big hitters in pain. And I started learning more about it. And then one day I realized that I hadn't had shoulder pain in, in almost a year. Mm. And a uh, similar thing happened with my low back. And reflecting on that, realizing that I had 20 something years of pretty consistent pain and had all these various treatments, all, most of them giving me some sort of um, temporary relief and then doing nothing but, but learning about things and having that be the thing that helped me the most was probably the most surprising thing that I learned. Mm. So it was actually learning more about what causes pain or what could cause pain rather than actually doing some kind of physical therapy that you think was. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think, um, it was, it was more learning about all of the bad messages that I learned. Mm. I I say bad, but I don't think they were maliciously taught to me. They were just what was accepted as fact. You know, you have pain in your back because there's something wrong with your back. You have pain in your hip because there's something wrong with your hip. You have pain in your shoulder because there's something wrong with the tissues in your shoulder. And every, every professional healthcare provider that I went to had their specialty or subspecialty to treat those tissues. And they would all give me a little bit of relief, but nothing actually fixed the problem. And what fixed the problem the longest, and I still, you know, the, the, the main goal is not to be completely pain-free because pain is an important aspect of life and it's an important experience. But um, the thing that, that brought me from this constant pain to now just episodic pain that seems fairly normal based on stuff that I do or maybe overdo or not do uh, was the education piece was learning more about it. And that was not my intention. I didn't really, uh, I didn't, I never assumed that that was going to be an outcome of that process. I was diving into that information because I was a clinician and a teacher and um, I was just interested in it. So it was really surprising. It seems pretty clear that uh, chronic pain that has been going on for many years, maybe there was an injury, maybe not. It seems there's a lot of uh, psychological factors that play into this almost reinforcing of this pain. What, What have you noticed are some common beliefs and misconceptions around pain that turned it into a kind of pattern that is hard to break free from? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the lessons that we talked about on the shift, you know, the uh, tissue pain or tissue damage and pain are not, are not synonymous. And you can have both 
you can have you know one without the other and vice versa that's a big one uh another one is um and it's very much related to that last one is that when i experience pain that doesn't mean that there's some sort of harm that's happening it could it could mean that but it doesn't automatically mean that that's another one and then the uh the belief structures around really those two fundamental problems are you know I, I have to not move. I have to not move in ways that provoke that pain. And then that turns into fear of movement overall in general. And that leads to other problems down the road. And honestly, the fear piece is what I believe to wind up the, our nervous systems the most. And that's been my experience. And all of the messages I was given by other healthcare providers, by you know information on the internet and things like that, really led to this underlying fear, not this overt, like I'm fearful of everything or hypervigilant of this process, but it was this underlying fear of like, this is just going to be my life. And I have pain in my shoulder because I have problems with my shoulder and eventually it's going to get to the point where I can't use my shoulder. And that's not been the case for me. And that's not been what a lot of the research is suggesting in people with persistent pain. Mm. There was an interesting thing we uh, discussed which is that because uh, pain is almost a warning signal for the body, and there's obviously adaptive benefit to it, that anticipating pain in some way actually creates it. So as you were mentioning, uh, a fear of moving a certain uh, limb that might have been injured for fear of it getting worse actually continues the pain. Now, as far as that, is there any research or any um, insights that you have about how physical activity can actually help us overcome pain, especially in those cases where it seems like the physical activity causes the pain? Hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a, a couple of things that just, just, I want to define a little bit. So, mm-hmm. so we can kind of have this conversation in good faith. Um, the pay, if, it's going to be really important for you and, and listeners, people that are watching this, to, to recognize that pain is, a, is an experience. So when we try to categorize it, when we try to create analogies and things like that, they're, they're almost always going to fall short of being um, adequate to, to, to categorize that experience. Um, so there are going to be some things that I say that seem a little too reductionistic uh, with regards to the, exper- the full experience of pain, because they are. Um, and and I, I I lack the I lack the proper terminolo- terminology and, and and verbiage and uh, ability to articulate the complexity of that experience on occasion. So I want everybody to recognize that first. Um, as an experience, uh, it pain is it's multifactorial. So we take the psych- psychological aspects, the fear and anxiety aspects of pain, the things that pain if we're going to talk about it as being designed, that pain was designed to do, and that is to, to drastically change a behavior. And when we think about it as an, as an alarm system, system or a warning system or you know, a danger alert system, again, that's being reduction, reductionistic, but it's, but it's for a function that we're talking about that way. Um, when, we, when we talk about it that way, uh, it makes sense that that alarm system, that danger system, or detection system can uh, be calibrated in various different ways, and one of the one of the ways to calibrate it is through expectation and fear and stuff like that. But uh, this the idea of movement variability, and we've gone over that a lot on our shift, uh, is one concept that seems to ring true when we're talking about persistent pain. And the idea of movement variability is. Uh, no matter what joint or region or multiple joints that we're talking about, the human body, we have a set of movements that are available to that joint or set of joints or regions, that kind of stuff. And most of our musculoskeletal tissues get their nutrients and get rid of their waste through movement to some extent, some of it a lot more than others because the tissue has no overt blood supply um, so it's really important for that that movement, and some has a lot more blood supply, so it can it can get the nutrients and, and get rid of waste pretty easily uh, just through the, the pumping of our blood. So when we're talking about movement being important with pain, that's at mostly the tissue level, 
But then there are some things in the central nervous system that movement do. And even at the, at the cortical levels, when we talk about the primary somatosensory cortexes, um, or primary somatosensory cortex and then primary motor cortex. Uh, and we, we've been able to, I say we, first, I'm a clinician, I'm not a researcher. So just, just to be clear with full transparency, um, when I say we, I'm talking about the, the, the research community, um, people that I rely on to, to generate and change my opinions on the subject as, as new, new information comes out, have been able to see changes in those cortical levels even through movement and with lack of movement. And that seems to, to have uh, a big impact in the experience of pain. Now, do we have very specific research or evidence that this specific movement helps with this particular experience of pain? I don't, I don't believe we do. Um, but we do have uh, pretty good research suggesting that movement in multiple planes that doesn't necessarily quote unquote poke the bear or provoke the pain over and over and over again, the painful experience seems to help that painful experience in the end. So it kind of reduces that painful threshold. The other aspects that it deals with are the, are a lot of the psychological aspects. When you are moving, when you're given instructions to move in a certain way, and maybe that way is uncomfortable, but it's not overtly painful and you trust that provider or that person or that, that concept of doing that, engaging in that process um, will help you on a psychological level. It helps to empower you. It helps to kind of restore your locus of control and like understand that I, that I do have agency here. I can move in ways that are not harmful to my body and in ways that might actually help my painful experience. And that's been well demonstrated, uh, mostly in case by case basis, but there's a lot of them at this point. Um, and some pretty decent random control trials that suggest that that is the case. It seems uh, pretty intuitive, actually, that moving around the part that's injured is uh, a stimulus for the body to heal it in some way, or, or at least retrain the nervous system so that it's able to adapt. There's um, some fascinating stories about certain meditators and yogis who through the use of a certain breathing meditation or mindfulness, they'll actually go into a surgery without anesthesia, like a, even like an internal surgery or something, you know, getting their tooth pulled or something that's, you know, 10 out of 10 on pain. And they'll just sit there with a smile. So just the, the fact that that's even possible seems pretty amazing. And I guess with, with all of that said, it's important to balance out what's the benefit of the pain and what's the harm of the pain. The benefit is like, you know, if your leg is broken, like don't walk on your leg, like you shouldn't meditate your way through that. But usually uh, when people are coming in with chronic pain, it isn't that. Usually it seems to be that they have this almost rewiring of the nervous system. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about these ideas of uh, sensitization of the nervous system? Because I always find them very fascinating from a scientific perspective. Sure, yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot to unpack in what you just, what you just yeah. said there. Um, first, uh, I do want to mention that when you say, you know, something that would be a 10 out of 10 pain, it's hard to say that because to some people, everybody's scale is different. And it's an objective scale for the individual. And if I was having a tooth pulled, and I was smiling and not experiencing pain, then I'm not experiencing pain. So it's, it's, you can't have pain and not experience it. Right, so I just, right. just want to, because that, that's another concept that you mentioned earlier about being an important concept to learn. That's a really important one to learn. Um, yeah, sensitization. So if we go back to the idea, again, the reductionist idea, but the idea that the nervous system uh, can act as an alarm system to detect danger. Um, and that system can be calibrated up or down, more sensitive, less sensitive, and that kind of stuff, then there has to be a mechanism to become more and or less sensitive. And the sensitization process, uh, we, we do know that a couple components to it. At the peripheral nervous system, there are some components that involve ion channels. And anytime you have cells uh, that transmit information, which most cells do to one extent or another, uh, the, most of that information is transmitted through ion channels, meaning the information is transmitted through various ions, various chemicals. Uh, and 
those chemicals have to have a way to get through the cell membrane. And without turning this into a lecture, those channels allow you to do that. So anytime, if we're talking about the sensory nervous system, anytime we sense something, uh, let's say right now I'm sitting on a couch and I'm sensing the pressure on my hamstrings or my glutes or my low back against the couch, and I can sense that and I can uh, I recognize that as being pressure. Well, that information is being transmitted through, ver through certain ion channels that transmit more mechanical information. And it goes through my nervous system and I recognize that as pressure. When we're injured, for instance, when tissue is damaged, injured, it makes sense that that, that detection system needs to be more sensitive for that injured area. Like you were saying, if I have a broken leg, I need to know about that or else I could potentially make it a lot worse. Um, so the way it does that is the, I believe the dorsal root ganglion uh, in conjunction with the central nervous system sends a higher density of ion channels to detect various things. So pressure, um, those kinds of stuff. And, and then the, those ion channels plug themselves into the part of the nervous system around in and around where there was damage. And now that part of the nervous system becomes, becomes more sensitive for those particular things, whether it's pressure, whether it's temperature, whether it's pH, other chemistry, uh, or other chemical levels, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's a normal process when you're injured. What we know is that for some reason, like one uh, you know, out of four or one out of five individuals don't ever come down from that sensitized level and then that can lead to peripheral sensitization or um, uh, essentially a, a form of chronic pain or the origin of a form of chronic pain. Um, we don't know why. It's probably a lot of genetics uh, and a lot of other nature versus nurture types of ideas, but, uh, but that seems to be the case. About 20 to 25% of individuals will experience chronic pain in their life, at least from the studies that I've read. So that sensitization now, under normal processes, again, I break that leg, my nervous system becomes more sensitive in my leg, and probably other areas, especially uh, with, with a, the, probably a, a, the more severe problem, I'll become more sensitive in the entire leg, maybe. Uh, maybe the other leg. I don't know about that, actually. But after the healing process comes and goes, my leg's healed, it's, it's good, whatever it is. Maybe it didn't heal perfectly, but the healing process, uh, can't, uh, you know, I went through the healing process. Um, well, then the nervous system kind of reverses that, pro that sensitization process. It takes those ion channels and it maybe redistributes them and creates a more balanced distribution of the various ion channels rather than having a higher density of one versus the others. Uh, and that's that normal process. And again, that 20 to 25% of individuals might not come down from that sensitized process. So it remains sensitized. And we actually get to the kind of central sensitization aspect. That's when we start to lose our filters. So all information, all um, afferent information traveling through our nervous system to our central nervous system, our brain gets filtered in various ways, depending on what the need is of the organism of the, the person. And there are filters all along that way. And with people with central sensitization or kind of this widespread body pain that doesn't have very linear rhyme or reason to it, uh, they lose the ability to filter out information. So it's all going to the central nervous system up into the brain and, and, and then our central nervous system uh, has to deal with it. And very often by getting bombarded that way, we experience massive pain, widespread pain. Mm -hmm. and it's chronic and it doesn't seem to follow any realistic patterns. It comes and goes. And in the healthcare world, people that have experienced that have been made to feel kind of crazy or like they're making it up and, and there's a, there's a huge disparity there. So what you're saying is that when we do have an injury, the area in peripheral sensitization, so it becomes more sensitive after the fact of the injury. Originally, there's pain with the injury. And then after that, what, even when the injury goes away, the pain remains. And then the central kind of sensitization is that filtering mechanism that's, you know, making you feel like your whole body isn't feeling every sensation at a, at max capacity is uh, somehow damaged. Is there 
Is there any theories that you've come to or seen about what kind of psychological factors play into central sensitization? Because I do know that things like depression, anxiety seem to be linked with all sorts of pain disorders, uh, chronic pain, like fibromyalgia, for example, where there doesn't seem to be any physical injury um, or even any precipitating injury, but still they're in real pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that that's good. And I was actually going to going to clarify a little bit, but you kind of did there. Um, chronic pain or persistent pain doesn't require an initial injury. Mm-hmm. Uh, that scenario I was giving you is more to illustrate the how sensitization is a normal process of the body, and sometimes it can go awry. But chronic pain and persistent pain do not require an initiating injury. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and you're right, people with kind of widespread body pain uh, and things that could be categorized as, as the origin being central sensitization, uh, don't have that precipitating injury in their history. And that's something to pay attention to because if we come at it from the point of view that there has to be, well, then we're going to be looking for the reason or the, the precipitating injury. And that can, uh, that can really pull us way off course with those individuals. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've talked about it on their shift. We get stories of like, you know, I'm in my, 50s and and you know back when I was like four I fell off the swing that must have been it because I can't figure something else out and even though that seems to be an important uh, life experience for you it's probably not the precipitating issue that's causing your your widespread body pain in your 50s um, <clears throat> so what exactly was the, I, I lost track I'm, I uh, what are some theories of the kind of psychological factors that play into uh, like fibromyalgia, for example, because of that link with the um, mental health sphere. Well, you you mentioned the the two big ones, depression and anxiety. There are even studies with total knee replacements where um, the the subjects that were treated for a concomitant depression and or anxiety uh, problem uh, got way better results than if they weren't after total knee replacements. So this is, this is a, a scenario where they're, there was enough degeneration to require a, a replacement and dealing with the, the concomitant mental health issue produced a much better outcome. Uh, so implying that it plays a huge role in pain and obviously recovery and agency and empowerment and locus of control and all these other things that are really important. Uh, as far as other mental health uh, problems, it, it's it's really hard to, to, to single things out other than depression and anxiety right now, because those are the, the major ones, but there seems to be a huge correlation with chronic pain and concomitant depression and or anxiety. So mm. those are, those are going to be the big ones. As far as mental health diseases and diagnoses, uh, I would say my experience is that there's a higher prevalence uh, in people with chronic pain but as you know, uh, in, at NUNM and on our shift, we're seeing um, we're seeing patients that are predisposed to having those mental health issues and chronic pain because their their socioeconomic status is of those that are more likely to have both of those and to not have a history of of access to healthcare. So, so the, so my experience is biased in, in that in that regard for sure. There's something interesting you said before about the framework we go into it is what we will look for in a sense. So obviously it's pretty well known that with certain imaging x-rays, that kind of thing, that if you're looking for like a structural problem, like you'll find it. But the question is, is that the reason they actually have pain? So is it even in many cases, I know on shift, you have told us about that for this case or that case, you shouldn't get imaging because even if it shows something, it's probably not even useful information. So what are some, what are maybe some places where imaging is like very helpful? Like you should definitely get an x-ray and times where it's, it seems to be the standard to get imaging, but it's really doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. And, and the imaging uh, standards uh, have changed drastically. When I started in practice, um, the imaging standards were, uh, were much different than they are now. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that you know, even people that you would assume would send away for imaging 
like surgeons and orthopedists and things like that for various things, they hold off very often now. Um, but you know, let's. I, I think you began that with you know where would it be helpful? You know, we have we have kind of recommendations or what we call rules from a lot of them are from Canada, the Ottawa rules for for X-ray and imaging procedures. Um, those seem to be pretty helpful in ruling people into a group where you would want to get imaging. So auto and ankle rules and knee rules and foot rules. Uh, there are Canadian cervical spine rules as far as getting imaging for the cervical spine. And, and most clinicians that would be prone to doing that know those. The other time that it seems to be important is when, and we see this in natural medicine, by the time we end up seeing a lot of patients, they've gone through so many healthcare providers. They've seen a lot of people. Very often they've had lots of imaging procedures, but if they haven't, and they're not responding to treatment that we think would create a some sort of outcome or response, then that's potentially an opportunity to, to do some imaging. And with that comes some risks of finding things, even though those things might be findings that you could see on the general population. Mm -hmm. So on the flip side of that, that's what we're discovering. We're, we're discovering, and, and it, this first started with the low back in the, in the late 80s, but mostly in the 90s and early 2000s that uh, you know, if you had low back pain and it was bad enough where somebody sent you out for an MRI in the, in the 80s and 90s and they saw disc herniation most of the time, as long as you had insurance coverage that would cover it, you'd have some sort of discectomy uh, or they would, they would do surgery on that disc. And, uh, and I think mostly we can attribute it to John Sarno doing studies on healthy college age individuals with no history of, or current uh, history of back pain. And what he saw was, and I'm probably butchering the number, but it's somewhere around 70 to 80% had findings on MRI disc herniations. And, and the level of those herniations changed in subsequent MRIs too. And what was consistent with that population was that they did not have back pain. So now we have this, well, if, not all people with, with disc herniations have back pain, then we have to be really careful about assuming that their, this person's pain is due to that disc herniation. So you have clinical findings, you know, radiculopathy findings and things like that. And we've gone over that on shift. We've gone over the clinical prediction rules that help us make those decisions a little bit better. Um, but we're starting to do things like sham surgeries now even in the, in, in the low back, in the knee, I believe in the shoulder. And we've discovered similar things. We've started to do imaging on individuals with, uh, with, without any kind of shoulder injuries. And we're seeing a higher incidence of rotator cuff tears and degenerative problems of rotator cuff tendons and things like that in the shoulder. And this, these are populations that don't have any pain or dysfunction, even athletic populations. Um, I think there were some studies done on, on asymptomatic and totally functional pitchers. And I think it was somewhere above 80%. It might've even been around 90% of them had uh, findings on MRI. Um, so my, my computer right now is, is dinging. Are you hearing that any, at, on your end? Uh, not, not really, no. Perfect, perfect. I just wanted to make sure my setting <laughs> wasn't to, for you to get all the, the computer audio. Cool, um, I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. So, and we're, and we're seeing that with, with knee pain too. We're seeing that with meniscal tears. We're seeing that with... ACL tears, partial and possibly incomplete, that the general population, some of them have that without any dysfunction. So when we start to get that information, as clinicians, we have to think, okay, we, we need to pull back a little bit and, and think about this. You know, if, if we just assume that everybody with a meniscal tear needed a required surgery and anybody with clinical signs of meniscal tear needed imaging, we need to rethink that now because the general population without any pain might have that. Um, and, and, you know, those are the three major areas, uh, shoulder, knee, low back, but there are some studies, just not as much uh, mm. uh, information on the, on, on other areas of the body. But we know that over the age of 30 to 35, uh, degeneration starts a lot of it, where it starts really depends on genetics and things like that in each, each individual and wherever it starts, it will continue as you age. I think David Butler actually called degeneration the, the 
the kisses of aging. And he said it much more eloquently than, than I did and with a much better accent. But um, <laughs> he called it the kisses of aging is degeneration. And, and, and that's, a, that's a much different point of view than, than degeneration as the enemy, degeneration as something that, that leads to the breakdown of the human body and condition. So does uh, that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Uh, you brought up the fact of surgeries. Now, it is known that even sham surgeries sometimes are effective, meaning that uh, somebody, you know, goes into the operating room, they say, you know, we're going to do this, that, and this, and then they actually don't do anything. They put them under, and then they wake up, and then their pain goes away or something like that. So that makes me wonder this aspect of, obviously what's called the uh, placebo effect. Um, so in, in cases where, you know, maybe they found something on imaging and it was, they also had pain. So they assumed, oh, it must be this, uh, this little mini fracture or something like that. And then they did the surgery and then they're better. So they're like, okay, therefore our theory was correct. But when you start getting into kind of the, the mind influence on things, it's like, well, maybe it wasn't because you can just pretend to do a surgery and sometimes people will feel better. So um, how do you navigate this world of knowing what is true within medicine when it's so complex and even sometimes research is hard to suss out what actually to make of it? Yeah, no, it, it's true. Um, so one of the things, a couple of things I, I, I like to point out, one is... Um, just like I talked about earlier, there are fundamental tenets or aspects of critical thinking and rational thought that, that really transcend specific information and delivery systems and stuff like that. One of them, and this is a really good critical thinking hack that I believe I learned from uh, Daniel Dennett, uh, one of his books or essays, or maybe I just saw him speaking on YouTube, is uh, anytime you're presented with new information or information where you have to generate uh, a significant opinion on, um, always kind of say f for that information to be false or falsifiable, what would need to be true? And just, just do that thought experiment. And I might not have the mental capacity to think of all of the ways to, to, to do that thought experiment, but at least it helps me and gets me thinking in that way. So, so with regards to uh, do all people with disc herniations need low back surgery? Well, in retrospect, we know that to be false because there's a ICD-10 code for failed low back surgery. I'm not sure if it's ICD-10. I definitely know there's an ICD-9 code, but there's a reason for that. Um, it's not because they, they messed up and they, they didn't actually cut out the disc and they didn't fuse the lumbar vertebrae. It's because they did that and the patient still had the same symptoms. Mm. So, but if back in the 80s, somebody said, hmm, what would need to be true to falsify the inf this, this opinion that all people with disc herniations need low back pain. Well, one of the things that would need to be true is the general population has disc herniations without any symptoms or any problems at all. Like that would be, that would be one thing, and, and that's what we found eventually. It took 10, 15, 20 years to, to figure that out, and then about 20 years or so to, to really kind of work its way into the healthcare system, but now that, that is true. Um, meniscal tears. Back when I started my chiropractic uh, uh, practice or my private practice, uh, if I diagnose somebody with a meniscal tear, I send them to an orthopedist right away. Now, as long as they're, they're not locked in full extension or flexion or somewhere in between and not able to move and able to still function fairly well, um, I'd send them to a physical therapist first. Um, you know, and, and if some if chiropractors are listening to this, they'll probably uh, be angry at me for not treating those patients specifically, but um, I'd probably send them to a physical therapist. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's interesting, but that's where we have to underpin our opinions with critical and rational thinking. And that's where I think we need to step outside of the professions to look at that. Because if we stay within the profession, we're probably going to continue to get information that confirms our bias already. Mm. Um, so, and, and that's where, you know, you get into, I mean, one, the, the first big foray into this idea of, uh, learning how I think and learning how I think in ways that aren't helpful was a book called, uh, you are not so smart. And it was actually a podcast, I believe. And I really started looking at the psychological aspects to, 
to logical fallacies, like the one where, you know, we find a finding, we do a surgery, the patient gets better. We assume that, that it's the reason the patient got better is because all of that, all of the premise was true. That's a, a post hoc, a post hoc ergo propter hoc logical fallacy because of this, that. And we have to be careful about making those as clinicians because when we do stuff, if there's an outcome that we like, we tend to remember it. Mm -hmm. And then we attribute a whole bunch of other things to that outcome when there are a lot of other variables out here that, that could have led to that outcome to begin with. Most of the soft tissue work that I taught, the mechanisms behind it are, in, in 2020, we know those mechanisms to be almost not even biologically plausible at this point. And yet they still ring true with a lot of people because when I do that, the patient or client experiences this. Therefore, that outcome justifies mm. the almost biologically implausible mechanism at this point. That's a, it's, a, it's an aberrant thought process. It's a logical fallacy. Mm. So critical thinking and rational thought, philosophy, the things that we talk about on, on my shift um, are really, really important the willingness to change your opinion when presented with new information is it is really important. And it sounds super simple. Um, but it's, it's almost depressing, uh, to, to see how many people aren't willing to do that in the healthcare professions. It's incredibly difficult. If, especially if you're invested in an idea, like imagine you were invested in an idea for like 20 years and you were sure of it. And then you get some new information that, challenges it and tries to turn it on its head, you're going to be like, ah, that's not really that significant because that would, that would be very painful process to admit that you were just wasting your time for 20 years or you were, uh, you know, looking things completely wrong on like a deep fundamental level. It's obvious uh, that it's there kind of as a self-defense mechanism of the mind of just, okay, it's working good enough. So let's Mm. keep going with it. But obviously it it gets in the way of uh, progress and science. So a question I have for you, there's a lot of theories about why chiropractic treatments like cracking and that's what people call it, um, mm-hmm. like crack your back, about why that works. Why do you think it works from everything you've seen in research and in your clinical practice? Yeah. All right. You're going to get me in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's I like what it. I love to do on this podcast, <laughs> get people in, in righteous trouble. <laughs> good, good. Um, so first, I, I don't want uh, anyone to appeal to my authority on the chiropractic profession. I'm a chiropractor, but that doesn't make me an authority on the entire profession. Uh, no more than um, like a chef would be an authority on on food and cooking for every for the entire world. So, mm-hmm. so, so I'll start from there. Uh, you know, I think that most of physical medicine techniques, especially when we talk about hands-on techniques, uh, most of the outcomes or results come from f- neurophysiological changes more than physical changes to the tissue. And that has a lot to do with, it's really hard to, uh, and or impossible, depending on, on how honest you are with yourself, to, gen- to generate very specific forces at specific vectors uh, much deeper than the levels of the skin. Um, the other thing is... Uh, tissues don't function by themselves. We talk about them that way. We learn about it. We learn about them in anatomy and physiology as specific muscles and things like that. But especially joints, they, especially the spine, they work in conjunction with all the other spinal joints and a lot of other joints, if we're talking about the thoracic spine, the ribs, et cetera, um, and all the muscles. And the nervous system is highly involved in that process. So I would, I would say... To simplify it, the main mechanism of manipulation or adjusting uh, is a neurophysiological change that's dictated by the person that's having the manipulation. Like, like it's it's going to be very individual, very much based on maybe a neurophysiological need. I'm not saying anybody needs manipulation. I know that's kind of that's kind of heresy with regards to being a chiropractor, but uh, maybe the you know somebody has increase motion or they have a bias towards adjusting. They've been told that your neck's out of place. This is why you've had headaches for 20 years. You need, you need to get adjusted. They get adjusted and uh, their headaches go away and it might be temporary. Maybe it's permanent. I haven't seen very many people uh, have the, the, the permanent results, but then again, if they're coming back to see me, it, 
wasn't permanent. So there's some bias there. Um, you know, it, but that could just be because they had, they truly believed that that manipulation would do something and that allowed their neurophysiology to respond to a greater extent than maybe somebody else's for that manipulation. And this is all very theoretical, um, but it's based on, as we study manipulation, we realize a lot of the mechanisms are probably not true. We realize that, well, we probably weren't that specific. You know, we can be, you know, five, six, seven segments off to where we thought we were doing the manipulation. So, you know, if we were at like T7, maybe something happened around like T2 or T8, T9, and it wasn't T7 specifically. That doesn't matter because there was a neuro, potentially a neurophysiological change. Now we have to weigh that against risk. And with a lot of areas in the, in the spine, as far as manipulation goes, the risk is pretty low. There are some areas that, that carry a risk. We, don't, we can't quantify it right now because the, the evidence is uh, all over the place. But there's some risk to cervical manipulation. So if the effects are probably nonspecific and neurophysiologically mediated and there's some risk, we have to decide, is the risk worth it? Now, what's been done is we've decided that rather than allow, give the patient enough information, in my opinion, to be truly informed, to give informed consent for that risk, however minimal it may be. So that's a long-winded way of saying, I don't really think we know the exact mechanism of how manipulation works. There's probably some physical aspects to it. Um, we don't even know if the cavitation, what we call a cavitation, and this idea that Gases get pulled out of solution if they're if they're if uh, uh, an, a completely sealed aqueous environment is is stretched to its maximum or as maximally as you can quickly. I don't even know if that's true, but I would say the neurophysiological effects or the effects mediated neurophysiologically is probably the least wrong mechanism that I could I could say right now. Mm. In your clinical practice, what are some of the most profound changes you've seen in patients from doing uh, a manipulation? Is there any cases where, you know, somebody has been in back pain for 10 years, you did a few manipulations and suddenly they're back pain free. I'm interested to see some kind of um, firsthand accounts of the yeah. effect. Yeah. It, it's, it, it's a good, it's a, it's a good question for sure. Um, I have definitely seen those miraculous events, you know, and, you know, when they happen, usually I try to attribute it to the patient as much as possible. Like, good for you. You found the one, the one thing, the one right thing that would help you after all those trials and tribulations, rather than taking, uh, um, taking credit for it and, and actually uh, attributing it to specifically the manipulation. Um, I've had patients say that, you know, X, Y, and Z have happened after manipulation it seems like it's not even biologically plausible for that to happen. I'm, I would never say that to them because that's their experience. And that was an outcome that they, A, weren't expecting and B, was incredibly positive for them. Um, and, I, and, I, and I specifically said X, Y, and Z because I don't even want to get into some of the, some of the, the less pl plausible uh, uh, outcomes of manipulation. Um, but yeah, I've seen that. I've had it happen with me. You know, I've had manipulations where I was like, oh my gosh, I have been in pain for such a long time and that seemed to help me and maybe help me for longer than that, that, that you know, three days to a week uh, amount of time. Um, but, you know, one of the, the biggest changes in my private practice uh, that I started to see way more positive outcomes with patients way more than I expected to was towards the last three years where I have a private practice and I closed that in 2015, you know, patients, I had a big waiting room with couches and they would come in, we'd sit on the couch, we would talk and we'd discuss things and we'd talk about, you know, their painful experience and we'd get into all those other aspects of it. How did it make you feel and that kind of stuff. Sometimes we'd go for a walk. Sometimes we'd get up and they'd be like, yeah, hey, you know, my back only hurts me when I walk a few blocks. All right, we're going, we're going, let's go get coffee need to walk a few blocks and see what's going on there and see the context of it. Or my neck only hurts when I'm in a car. All right, let's go to your car. And I want you to kind of get to that position where your neck hurts and we'll just talk about it a little bit more. And by doing that and then coming back in an office, they're like, oh, my neck feels a lot better. 
or we come back in, do a little bit of soft tissue work. We go back out to the car and we're like, that's great. All right. Call me tomorrow. Call me on your Bluetooth from your car and tell me how you're feeling. Mm. Um, sometimes I wouldn't even do a lot of the hands-on stuff with the patient, depending on, on what they felt was their need for the day. Um, and I would still have those results too. So, so it got me thinking, you know, what, what would, if the idea is that I have to do this hands-on treatment, a specific treatment to get a specific outcome, the thing that would need to be true for that to be falsified is if I didn't do those things, if I could still get those outcomes. And that's what I was starting to see in my practice. Mm. What are some of the therapies that you like to use the most and why? I know on shift you brought up the uh, novel movements and things like that. And I found that very interesting and uh, wanted to see if you had any other things that you wanted to comment on, especially for pain, chronic yeah. pain. Yeah. So I think probably I will recommend more concepts than specific treatments. Mm -hmm. um, mostly because I think at the conceptual level, we can transcend delivery systems. So mm. I'm a big fan of hands-on stuff. And that could mean anything. I'm a, I'm a big fan of not assuming that you have to create some sort of noxious stimulus to cause an effect because usually that idea comes with this heavy baggage of my hands are changing that person's tissue. So I'm not saying you have to do all light stuff, but I'm generally saying that um, if there's a huge amount of discomfort, it's unnecessary because you're not actually doing something specific to the tissue. But I do like hands-on stuff for a number of different reasons. It's that, that uh, uh, Diane Jacobs, uh, I think she coined the term human primate social grooming. When we place mm. our hands on somebody, there's a social grooming aspect to it or a social aspect to it, if we want to just leave it at that, that I believe is uh, really important for kind of human-to-human -human interactions. So those hands-on treatments can be manipulation. They can be soft tissue therapy. They can be, you know, any of the named techniques out there, as long as you're not, you haven't been completely indoctrinated in this cult-like idea that it is this specific mechanism and or this specific guru is the only person that can do it. You can just learn how to do it. And then in 40 years, you'll be able to, to attain that, that level of greatness. Um, <laughs> and you'll notice the sarcasm there in that, <laughs> that statement. Um, so I do like hands-on treatment. I'm a big fan of massage therapy, huge fan of massage therapy. Uh, not because I think we're doing specific things to tissue, but because mm -hmm. I think it gives us an opportunity to get some sort of hands-on stimulus that's novel to us because we're not doing it to ourselves and it's not something we, we uh, um, experience on a regular basis. But I also think, and this is where I, I differ uh, from some of the other folks about pressures and things like that. You know, I've experienced massage a lot uh, and I do like a massage therapist that'll put a decent amount of pressure here and there, not the entire time, not in, in, in a sadistic way, but I find that my ability to yield to that pressure and to breathe through certain pressures, especially if an area is uncomfortable, it helps me in what I believe. So it's a belief, it's an opinion that's not based on any evidence, but I believe is um, <clears throat> me practicing experiencing a noxious stimulus and not responding to it by experiencing pain. So it's helping me to calibrate my alarm system a bit. And, and, I, and for, for myself and other people that I've talked to about this concept, it seems to ring true. Again, it's a concept. I'm only saying it personally because I don't think there's a lot of evidence out there for it. Or at least if there is, I haven't read it. Mm. So the idea of novel movement is really any movement that you're not currently doing. So if I had you know, shoulder pain for years and I wasn't doing you know, particular movements on my shoulder because I thought that would be painful, well, by exploring that range of motion in a way where I'm breathing deeply and diaphragmatically, I'm, I'm in a safe space. I believe that I, that I have the agency to move that shoulder and not harm myself. By doing that and exploring that limit of, oh, right there, I feel a little bit of pain, but I'm still in a safe space. I know I'm not damaging my shoulder by doing that and continuing to move that way. That threshold will increase. Are you making any tissue changes in the five seconds you did that? No, not at all. 
Um, so something's happen, happening neurophysiologically. You're working with your own alarm system to help recalibrate it a bit based on the current status of your tissues, not a historical status of, of, of your tish, tissues or an assumed status of your tissues. Mm-hmm. So there's not a ton, like if you were to search on PubMed for novel movements or you know, that kind of stuff, you probably wouldn't find a lot of evidence for novel movements helping chronic pain. But we do know that that movement variability seems to be really important. You know, you look at ergonomic studies and it's not that you sit at a computer in the perfect way. It's that you move around throughout the day. You sit in various positions. And when you actually do high-speed photography, you see that people will move around a lot Mm. by speeding it up. Or just, you know, if I were to stand there in real time, you wouldn't see a lot of movement. But if you sped that up, I'd be all over the place Mm. in that position. Just, you know, and it has a lot to do with that that movement variability aspect. So um, hands-on stuff novelty, whether it's novel movements or novel stimulus, when a lot of the hands-on stuff can provide that. But it's all going to be based on the patient's goals and or something that's really meaningful to them. Usually a goal is meaningful. But if you know if if you want to be able to squat so you can actually garden, you know, especially right now with the when we're quarantined, people are like, I, I want to start gardening again. Well okay. Mm-hmm. That's why you want to squat. Not you're not. I'm not going to have you. Prob- I'm not going to have you do a bunch of kettlebell goblet <laughs> squats to reach out. I might, but that's going to be a conversation between us mm-hmm. about how to reach that goal. And if it makes sense to you and that's meaningful, we're going to do that. And that's why a lot of people have poo-pooed exercise and movement because we've just prescribed these things that weren't meaningful to individuals. That person that wants to squat to, uh, you know, to uh, to garden, they might be given a bunch of deadlifts because somebody thinks deadlifts are really good for knee and back pain. Well, we didn't really explain how this is relevant to that person's goal and how this particular exercise might be really meaningful to that goal and then ask them what what they think about it. I don't really want to do deadlifts. Okay, cool. Let's do something else. Um, and that, we've done that a lot. We've done, we've done a lot of meaningless exercises because we've, we've thought that those exercises do very, very specific things in the human body and fix certain problems. Mm. That's such a key aspect of motivation for exercise. I definitely find that in myself. It's like, you know, if you just follow the research and you say, oh, well, you know, squats are the best thing, but you hate going to the gym. You hate doing squats. Like you're just not going to do it. You might as well just go for, you know, like a hike or something. If that's what you actually like doing, or maybe a sport or maybe martial arts or something that's more, um, more kind of captivating. And in the end, it has greater benefits than maybe, you know, maybe squats do build strength 20% greater or something. But like, if you do it, not at all, you get 0% gain from it. So it's kind of uh, that kind of thing with that. Yeah, if you do it for a week, and then and then don't do it for two years, I mean, you're not getting the same benefit as something that you would do. And the concept that I would pass on to a lot of people is um, create, a mo- create movement habits, whatever that means to you, whatever's meaningful. Like for me, it's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You know, that seems to be the thing that I can stick to the longest period of time and, and keep, keep, stay interested in. Because I've had the same thing. You know, I grew up going to gyms and I hate going to gyms. As an introvert, you know, going out to a, a space with a bunch of people that just want to call me bro and talk about weird <laughs> stuff that I don't really want to talk to them about is, is horrible to me. But when I was in private practice, I had a bunch of equipment in my office. So I could do that on my own. But now that I'm not in private practice anymore, I don't have access to that equipment. And I do have some of it in the house, but I just don't use it as much. So I have to find something that's meaningful to me. You know, going for a walk with my dogs is meaningful, but that's not enough of a movement habit to support the kind of uh, uh, movement, strength, and exercise goals that I have. So I have, to, I have to play with that. You know, in the end, it'll end up, that concept will end up freeing people from very rigid ideas of what movement means to them. They could do something, I mean, we've had, we have patients that are like, yeah, you know, I do acro yoga. That's great. Or, you know, the, a bunch of you know, pole dancing uh, classes have shown up. And a lot of people have been doing those because they're just novel and interesting. Do that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, CrossFit, whatever you want to do, it's fine as long as you find some meaning in it. And it's, and it's something that you could stick to. And if you don't stick to it, find something else. Find something else that challenges you. Find something else that's interesting and continue that. That's really the, the biggest concept I can pass on to people. Mm. Yeah, I found for myself that um, doing martial arts, specifically kickboxing, Muay Thai was way more engaging than lifting weights. 
to, um, and it had an interesting side effect too, which is it actually made me motivated to lift weights. Cause I was like, okay, I'm getting strong for this. Not just, you know, to look good or not just because I should, but because, oh, I want to get stronger at this. So then that whole gym culture starts making sense where you're trying to gain some kind of functional strength for something that you really want to be able to do. And then that brings even more happiness because you're more able to do the things. Yeah, sure. uh, I was wondering in your experiences with jujitsu, is there anything that you've learned from jujitsu that you apply to uh, healing and like physical medicine practices? Like, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think, yeah, I, I will say absolutely. Yes. And the caveat is it's very specific to the place that I train. So I train at straight blast gym and the founder of straight blast is Matt Thornton. He is a very philosophical, uh, uh, person who applies a lot of the same, same things that we talked about kind of rational thought and critical thinking underpinning to, to the philosophy of teaching, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and his concepts his concepts of, uh, you know, fundamental skills for combat sports. So if, if I were to say, uh, I'm going to teach you, and this is, I think, directly from uh, something that Matt said, if I'm going to teach you Canadian geometry, people would be like, what is that? It's, geometry is a fundamental <laughs> concept that would transcend cultural boundaries, for instance. Mathematics is like that. Uh, fundamental combat skills if they're truly fundamental will transcend uh any delivery system whether it's it'll they'll apply for brazilian jiu-jitsu you know as long as you know as long as it's within the rule set of brazilian jiu-jitsu you know a lot of striking isn't but depending on where you go to uh it will transcend judo it'll transcend muay thai it'll transcend you know american boxing uh you know Sambo, a lot of the martial arts I just mentioned really focus on a lot of those fundamentals. And martial arts that don't focus on the fundamentals and they focus on flashy techniques and they fo focus on uh, things that require flexibility or, or various physical attributes to be able to do, uh, those are less useful and less interesting to me. So the the correlate to physical medicine is uh, especially the manipulation hands-on stuff. If you learn the fundamental skills of applying forces efficiently and detecting where things are different and there is asymmetry in the movement and being able to put together all this information to come up with an opinion of, of what could potentially be going on in the theory and being able to apply a force to, to hopefully help that process, help the movement, help, help decrease pain, that kind of stuff, then it doesn't really matter what the, the, the delivery system is. And that's a kind of, it's kind of what gets me in trouble as a chiropractor because I'm not of the opinion that manipulation is specifically a chiropractic thing. That's why I, that's why I, it's like nails on a chalkboard when people call manipulation chiropractic. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, manipulation, is, it, if it's useful, should transcend delivery systems. And that's why I'm not, I'm not threatened if physical therapists are doing it or anybody else for, for that matter, if, if they're able to do it. And that concept I got a lot from, from uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, specifically at Straight Blast Gym uh, and in, in Portland here, but they're all over the world. Uh, you know, if, if, you're, if, if, you have a, if you're doing a martial art that doesn't predominantly focus on things like posture, pressure, uh, connection, distance management, uh, and angles, which would be a subset of distance management, so you're probably not doing anything that's worth doing. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Have you ever seen those um, those videos of uh, like traditional martial artists, like chi masters, and they? I think I brought it up to you one time, and they go against like this like MMA fighter, and it's just like they just get like mopped. It's <laughs> it's it's kind of sad to watch actually, but I. Interestingly, I think it plays into um, our conversation about pain and physical medicine because these so-called chi masters, they really believe that they have this special power. But when they actually test it, you know, it's nowhere to be found. 
And I think um, there's a lot of correlates with obviously healing practices of why people believe it works. And that that's a really good point uh, that I think we can take from martial arts and apply back to uh, healing and, and medicine, which is like, find the things that are like universal about it and uh, focus on those rather than doing, you know, fancy, fancy things. Um, although the fancy things are nice because the ritual aspect seems to have its own healing uh, power that's beyond, you know, simply placebo as well. Um, it's true. But, but yeah, there's definitely something to be said. Also, I found um, it increases your, let's say your tolerance to adverse feeling like doing a martial art or any kind of sport where you're physically pushing yourself, your ability to tolerate and not be like emotionally or phys- uh, psychologically bothered by a pain here or there or an emotional state here or there changes a lot. Um, and even the, the context of the, the pain seems to alter it. Like I was telling you the story of, you know, if I came back from sparring and I, you know, I kick somebody in the elbow and you know how that, how that feels. Yeah. Um, and I'm just limping around, but it's, there's pain, but I'm not like upset about it. I'm like, Oh, like it just reminds me every time. Oh, I kicked this elbow, that kind of thing. And it, it's like actually not unpleasant. It like almost reminds me, Oh, I trained. Okay. That's good. So, you know, if, if that had happened differently, like if I was walking down the street and some bike like cut me off and hit my leg and I was like, ah, I would just all day be like, I can't believe that happens blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I would be in pain painfully rather than just experiencing pain and being like, oh, okay. So yeah, pain, you know, the experience of pain carries with it multiple levels of suffering for different people. And I believe context is really key there. Um, you know, like, like you said, if, you know, if I, if I stub my toe, you know, obviously it hurts. If I hit my shin on the coffee table, it hurts. But it's not going to affect my life. But if I'm a, you know, a top tier ballet artist and I do the same thing, well, that could, I mean, that, that could potentially change, especially if I had a, had to do something really important that evening or, or that day, that could very much change things for me. And the context would be really important there. You know, likewise, if I, you know, if I, if I were to bend forward and pick up a pencil right now, I might get a little tweak in my back because I've been sitting on this couch for a little bit. And it's not that sitting on the couch is bad. I haven't really been moving. It's not a big deal to me. But if, if I've been told that, oh, you know, as soon as you hit your 40s, you're, you know, your back's on its way out and my neighbor, you know, is disabled and can't, you know, can't, can't work and has a family and they're on disability. And I do that same thing. I pick up that pencil. Well, the context of all of that might change the way I experience that little, that, just that little blip, that little homeostatic blip in my musculoskeletal system to where I panic and I freak out and it hurts a lot more and I suffer a lot more from it because uh, I got all these other thoughts, you know, my back, I, this could be the beginning of the end for me and I, you know, my, my family might suffer because of this. You know, it, it, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot to say about context. And I agree. I think martial arts, so again, here's a thought experiment that I've been playing with for a while and I haven't really been able to, engage a lot of other people in it but i i would when i moved to portland i was doing a lot of whitewater kayaking at a pretty high level and dropping off big scary waterfalls and, and do, running a lot of class five stuff and um as i went through chiropractic school i did that less and less because i didn't have a, enough time and also i would say the same thing happened with climbing uh rock climbing a lot of outside stuff and spent a lot of time doing a lot of that stuff especially when i was in Colorado. Um, and a lot of things that to me were anxiety provoking and to actually perform at the level I was performing, I had to overcome that anxiety and, and do the thing that I needed to do Mm -hmm. or else the consequences were pretty severe. The less I did that, the more I've experienced anxiety in my life. Mm -hmm. So the thought experiment is if, if we practice anxiety provoking types of scenarios that are somewhat safe and we have somewhat control over it. The control with kayaking and climbing is the level of skill and some of the safety measures in place. Um, then overall it will help when I'm encountered with anxiety provoking things that I don't, you know, consciously engage in. And I think that, that the, the correlate is what you're talking about with martial arts. 
you know, like a like Matt Thornton, he you know, the founder of Straight Blast. He's he's like six eight, you know, much heavier than me. If he gets on top of me uh, in jujitsu and gets me in a really compromised position, it is very claustrophobic, and it's like I have physiological responses, and most people do to that kind of pressure. And being able to breathe through that and recognize, okay, I do have a little bit of space here. And I do have the fundamental skills to actually improve this space, shift my hips a little bit, get a little bit of space in here. It, it helps you recognize that, that, that feather edge where you're right, right around that edge. Like, okay, I'm going to freak out right now. Or, okay, I, there, I have more resources here. And I think that martial arts is, uh, is an important way to, to test some of that stuff for some people. Like right mm-hmm. now, it's really the only way that I, that I test myself in anxiety-provoking situations, um, situations where, you know, I'm not in control and I have to use the skills that, that I've learned to become more in control of a, of a scenario where two people are using their own skills and, and their own will against each other. There's, and that's why it's really important to actually practice those things in a live environment and not, mm-hmm. you know, that's why the, the chi master, you know, who gets <laughs> destroyed by an MMA uh, artist or somebody that does MMA, um, it, it's sad in a way because, yeah, they were part, probably part of a weird cult-like mentality, but they also had that very strong belief to, to their, to their credit, test that belief in a live environment. And because they didn't practice those things in a live environment and never test it, they get destroyed. Mm-hmm. And also because they're claiming that they can do things that, that are not really not physically impossible. I mean, we've had that at, at, at NUNM. We've had people that are like, you know, I knew my master could, you know, could float and do this. I'm like, I don't think that they can. <laughs> and and, and usually some videos. Students, not, not even that. Like, honestly, <laughs> if you could do that and you're not using that kind of power um, for good in this world, then you're evil. I think. Like if you have superpowers and you're not using them to help people, then you, by default, I think you're evil. So, you know, <laughs> there's I, a, there's this famous, um, uh, Buddhist story of, um, so the Buddha was just standing by, uh, like a, a river or, or like a lake or something like that. And there was this guy who was saying, Oh, I can, you know, I can walk across, water and I could do all these things. And there was all these gatherings around him. And, uh, the Buddha is like, why, why do you need to walk across water? Like, it's like one penny to just take the boat. And he just like takes the boat and goes across. It's like, okay. So (laughs) for all you trained in a cave for 30 years to be able to levitate, but like, okay, like, so what are you going to do about that? (laughs) <laughs> so you don't so you, so you don't touch the luscious grass that's yeah, exactly. great good job yeah um but yeah the the idea of like exposure therapy is really big in um psychological treatments especially for things like ptsd um or like phobias anything like that where there's a strong fear the thing that helps most of overcoming a fear is actually to do the thing that you're afraid of. And that's like the last thing that anybody wants to hear because it's the thing that you're afraid of. But in fact, small graded safe exposures to something that you're afraid of actually enable you to overcome it. And interestingly too, they give you a kind of resilience that applies to other factors. So like when you overcome, you know, your fear of getting punched in the face when you're sparring or getting, you know, your arm ripped off in in jujitsu, you know, when something happens in your everyday life, it just doesn't, provoke that same fear because you have like a real fear, a primal fear. Uh, and it, that definitely also applies to pain, like people in physical pain, because they're afraid to move. But it's like the only way you'll know if you're safe to move is like to just try a little bit, even if it's uncomfortable, even if you're afraid that there's some minor injury. Obviously, if the injury is very acute or just recently happened, you probably shouldn't do that. But if you've had an injury for you know 10 years or so, and you've been avoiding an activity, the detriments of avoiding that activity could be way, way greater than anything you think you're gaining by um, trying to preserve yourself. True. Pain is very protective. So even if there is an injury where doing a certain movement would, would, would damage that tissue more, more than likely you wouldn't be able to do that. 
Mm. Uh, that's that's the thing that people need to, to pay attention to. And I think that's it's an empowering idea to, you know, and may and and I'm not saying that nobody needs to see healthcare providers for this, because it is nice to see somebody and they can objectively evaluate you and determine if there is tissue damage, what the extent of that tissue damage is, and give you more specific parameters about what to do and what not to do and help you figure that out. But but honestly, if they're not doing that and those aren't the goals, then they're probably not helping you. If they're not helping you figure out parameters of what is safe, and they're probably not helping your pain. I think Lorimer Mosley created this, uh, this uh, equation. It's pain equals the credible evidence of safety minus the cre- credible evidence of danger. And, um, you know, it, the, the, the point of that equation is to figure out where you can increase the credible ev- evidence of safety and decrease the credible evidence of danger. And um, that shouldn't be something that you're not involved in as the, as the individual experiencing pain. That very much should be something that you're deeply involved in, in fact, driving that process and, don't, and not letting anybody drive it for you. Mm. So to kind of close this up, yeah. what are some things that you want people who are suffering from chronic pain to know? Some last messages. If you're suffering from chronic pain, uh, know that uh, that your pain is real, um, and it's hard to articulate your experience to somebody else because that's kind of the nature of experiences. Especially the more chronic and complex it is, the more complex the experience is, and it's really hard to explain that for people that have had really complex experiences to explain them to people that haven't had those experiences. So your pain's real, and the healthcare system, the way that we've been thinking about and treating pain has not, has been more wrong in the past. We're, we're getting to the point where we're less wrong about it. And that on behalf of the healthcare system, healthcare providers, myself included, need to apologize to people in chronic pain. And, and we need to recognize that we've failed a lot of those folks. And that they're, some of the big components are going to be mental health, um, lifestyle, hygiene, you know, not necessarily like body odor and stuff like that, but sleep hygiene and sleep uh, processes, uh, nutrition, proper nutrition and eating and all of the social and uh, uh, kind of spiritual aspects of of what eating and food means to us. Um, And, you know, movement, experimenting with movement and having agency and having the locus of control and driving the process, not demanding certain types of care, but driving the process uh, as far as the concept concepts we've discussed. That's really important. And, and, and somebody that's in chronic pain or persistent pain should seek out healthcare providers that do just that, in my opinion, that recognize the shortcomings of healthcare treating chronic pain, apologize for it, and work with the patient to, to help them reach whatever goals they have, whether it's to be, to not be in as much pain, which is very often a very common goal, but then all these other goals around that pain um, and know that it's, it's a multifactorial process. So, you know, if you go to see somebody for physical medicine stuff and musculoskeletal uh, physical medicine types of issues and, uh, and they, and they want to pull in some mental health experts or at least that concept that's a layer that's really, really, really important. And that is not to say that pain is just in your mind or in your brain. It's not to say that you have psychological issues and that it's all fake. It's to say that that layer of the experience is really important. Mm. So we need to take that seriously. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Irving. Yeah, it's been my uh, pleasure. Being on the show, I always love talking about these kind of things and getting into the depths of the truth. So um, for our listeners, is there any way that they can contact you, see what you're up to, follow you anywhere? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I am definitely on Instagram. I don't know what my Instagram handle is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Facebook, I keep mostly to, to private friends and family, but mm-hmm. uh, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, if you search for you know, Timur and Chiropractor, you'll find ways to contact me uh, in multiple venues, whether it be social media and uh uh, an email, but, um, but I'm open, I'm open to having discussions. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm on, I'm on a lot of social media, uh, groups, 
uh, that do just what we're doing, discuss this stuff. So uh, you can find me on a lot of those venues. Excellent. It's been my pleasure. I, I really appreciate this conversation. And then, as you know, I, I, I love talking about this stuff. Yeah, me as well. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Irving. And uh, enjoy you, the rest of your day and all the free time that we, we now have to a large extent. So do awesome good things with it. Yeah. Yep. Thank you.